there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. If I can pray with us once more as we come and consider this passage in particular together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, I pray that just uh, in this time that we have together tonight, that you would open our hearts, uh, open our, the eyes of our hearts, as Paul liked to say, that we would see, not just with our physical eyes, but with our hearts, the wonder, the meaning, the beauty, the glory of you, our maker, our creator, becoming one of us. Um, let us see it tonight that we would be moved by your grace and your love, that peace would fill our hearts, and that we would be moved to live and to love those that you've put in our life. Would you come and teach us tonight? Awaken our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, one of the things that we have said as we've been looking uh, the past couple weeks in our Advent series at the details of the birth of Jesus that we see in the Gospels, one of the things that we see over and over is the playing out of exactly what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. It was read for us earlier. It's been kind of our background verse throughout this series, and it's where Isaiah says, in the land of deep darkness, that is his description of this world that we live in. It is a land of deep darkness. Now, sometimes, by God's grace, we experience joy in this world. There are good things in this world. There are wonderful things in this world. But the reality is, it is a world of darkness. It is a world that is not the way it's supposed to be. And every now and then in life, you bump up against that reality, sometimes in a very harsh way, and you're reminded, oh my gosh, this is not home at all. 2020 has very much been that kind of reality, right? It's been a dark year. It's been a hard year. It's been a wake-up kind of year where I think we have this incredible opportunity to come to our senses and say, oh yeah, this world is a dark place. It's dangerous. It's broken. It's fractured. It's not the way that it's supposed to be. And as we come to the Bible, we come to realize, oh, wait a minute, it never has been. You know, sometimes we, we like to get on nostalgic about the old days, the good old days. You know, I wish we could just go back to the good old days. Here's how it was. Whenever I was growing up, we didn't have all of these issues and problems. And Well, that's just not true. <laughs> it's amazing how selective and short our memory can be. When we come to the Bible, we realize, no, this world has been a dark place for a long, long time. All the way back at the fall. 
And I was struck in that, that hymn that we just sang, O Holy Night, where it says, A weary world rejoices. That is the response when your heart comes to see the full significance of the incarnation of Jesus. A weary world. What a description of our world. Is there a better description? This world is weary. Weary over loss and things being broken and not the way they're supposed to be. I mean, even to look back at our week, have you gotten news this week that wearied your soul? And here we walk into a holiday season, you know, this time that is so nostalgic and sometimes, you know, we, we build up the expectations. I had a friend say to me today, hey, would you pray for my family? Pray that, that we wouldn't be too disappointed by how Christmas not, doesn't turn out the way that we hoped it would be. Isn't that like a great thing for all of us to remember at Christmas? You know, we always forget. You know, don't build up your expectations. Clark Griswold told us that, you know. Uh, we watch that, you know, that's, that's Clark's problem. He always builds up his hopes and they get crushed, and that's reality so often. So maybe we're feeling that right now as we come into Christmas in 2020. We're, we're coming in and, and it doesn't feel the way that it's supposed to be. And we're tasting that darkness, and I think that's an incredible opportunity for us to come and to really rejoice in the wonder and significance of what happened, what we actually celebrate at the birth of Jesus. And it is described as light coming into our darkness. You know, it's amazing as we look through just the details of the birth story, how much Luke and Matthew, they want to show us like things were dark. Things were not the way that you would expect them to be. It wasn't working out the way that you'd imagine. And all of those details are just throughout the description. We even see that as we come into this little passage that we're looking at tonight. We're looking at the, the birth announcement that comes to, of all people, the shepherds. I mean, this is the most important birth that's ever taken place. The birth of the Messiah was something that was anticipated for thousands of years before. In fact, this was the moment that all of human history would pivot. Everything that came before this moment was just le leading up to it, and everything that's happened since has flowed from this event where literally the reality of the universe itself was changed whenever the Creator entered into His creation and the Messiah came. And here at the birth announcement, I mean, we just think, you know, we do birth announcements. You know, we send them out to all of our friends whenever uh, a child has been born, and we want people to share in our joy, and we want them to know what's happened. We've had some births in our own church here lately, and we send out those announcements, and we, we want to say, hey, rejoice. We want everybody to know what's happening. But who would you imagine the birth announcement of the king of the world to come to? the one that the whole world was waiting for, who would it come to? What would it look like? And I'll guarantee you it would be nothing like what we see actually happening in the story. You know who this birth announcement comes to? It comes to shepherds. Now, that's very significant in this day because shepherds in this culture were kind of right at the bottom of the culture. They were kind of shady characters. That's the way that people looked at them. They kind of, they were, they were seen as being thieves. Sometimes they were. They were always out there in the fields with the animals. You know, they were, people were just suspicious of them, and they were kind of outcasts in society. And because they were always with the animals, they were never clean enough to come into temple worship. And so they were seen as being especially sinful and outcast and just low social status. And yet, who does God choose to bring this unbelievable birth announcement to? Yeah, you got it, the shepherds. And of course, it, meet, it, it, it perfectly fits with every other detail that we see here, right? 
we see that in every detail of the, of the birth of Jesus that God is choosing the upside down way of how we would expect it in the world. He's choosing the nobodies. He's choosing these poor peasant young parents that are from backwoods Nazareth. This is no kind of a place that anybody wanted to say they were from. This is this kind of nowhere region in the, in the, the Roman Empire. This was kind of a forgotten corner of the world in Palestine. I mean, the real power, the real things that were happening were in Rome under the emperor at this time. That's where the power was. That's where the fame was. And so often in the world, that's how we think things work. You know, if you're going to get things going, if you're going to build a movement, if you want to make things happen, well, what, how do we understand that happens from our human perspective? We, 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 need, we need the right kind of people. We need the people in power. We need beautiful people, right? If we're going to promote our, our, our project here, we need the right people, beautiful people. We need uh, prestige. We need fame. We need this thing to go viral. We need the right people to like this thing, and then everybody's going to see it. That's how things work in the world, through human power, through human ability, through human beauty. And yet God, in, in his way of bringing salvation to the world, he upends all of these things. In fact, he chooses just the opposite. He chooses to work in the most lowly ways in the most unlikely ways, in the hardest circumstances, and to choose the most unlikely people. And so the question is, why does he do this? And the answer is, it demonstrates the very essence of salvation itself. You see, God, God's salvation is entirely through the power of God and nothing of the power of man. And that's what every detail shows. That it's all of him. That it's nothing, it's nothing in our strength, it's nothing in our ability that brings about this salvation. It is entirely of his grace and his mercy and his power. And when he does it in this way, he gets all the glory and we get none. And that's the very demonstration that we see played out, even the details here. So we come in, we find these shepherds, they're out in the middle of the night, out in the dark fields out there. And then all of a sudden, we see the, an angel of the Lord, in verse, in verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Now, just think about this scene. Imagine you're with them. If you've ever been way out in the country at night, you know, far away from any streetlights and everything, you know it gets really, really dark. That's the scene. They're out there just like every other night. And then the most unbelievable light show you've ever seen cuts on. Boom! Here's an angel. We're told that the glory of the Lord was shining around him. And their response is the same that we've seen anytime somebody encounters an angel. They're terrified. I mean, anytime a human being encounters an angelic being that has been in the very presence of God, reflecting his glory, there's only one response. It's terror. And that is their response here. And the angel calms them. Do not be afraid. And then he gives them this announcement of the gospel itself. But the angel said to them, this is verse 10, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Kids, what does good news mean? Pop quiz. Ah, we haven't done this in a while, right? Yes. Thank you, LG. It means gospel. We talk about that a lot, right? Here's the gospel. They are announcing the gospel for the first time after the incarnation. In the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Now, all of that should have hit home for them. That was all the details. That was the Messiah, the son of David, the one who was going to come into the world and usher in God's kingdom to bring about worldwide peace. All of God's promises bound up on the coming of the son of David. And in the details of the announcement, the angels are saying, he is here. Nobody else gets this announcement. And then they say, here is the sign for you to look for. You will find him in a manger. 
Now, we might think, as we think about this story, well, this is kind of the thing they did in that day. You know, they put kids in cow troughs whenever they were born. Well, in fact, you know, they might have been old-fashioned, but they weren't dumb. This wasn't what you did with babies in this day. That's why this was a pretty good sign, because it's going to stick out like a sore thumb. Hey, you know you're going to find the right one when you go and you see somebody has put their baby in a cow trough. Okay, you're going to know right off. But that sign would even demonstrate the uniqueness of salvation itself. That the Messiah, the, the king of the whole world, would be laid in a manger. So they get this birth announcement. The angels are taking this in. And then in verse 13, they just get blown away. I mean, they, uh, this was already an amazing experience, but now it just goes next level. In verse 13, we're told, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. What is happening here? In this moment, and I, I'm not aware of anything like this taking place in all of Scripture. Literally, heaven itself is opened up to the view of the shepherds. They're able to gaze into the heavenly throne room and the heavenly host. Now, that host is an old-timey word that means army. The armies of heaven, the, the legions upon legions of angelic army are standing before the throne and the thing that they love to do, they're standing before the throne and they're worshiping God. But yet in that moment, it's open and they see it and they hear it and they're blown away at the overflowing joy and worship of heaven. Now, I want you, what I want you to notice here is the lyrics of what they're singing. Glory to God in the highest. Here's what's happening here. The angels are watching what's just taken place. And now, it's interesting, in 1 Peter, we're told about the gospel that the angels long to look into the significance of the gospel. You know, God didn't tell the angels uh, as he's working out salvation through all of history what was happening. Paul calls it the mystery of the gospel. And he says, no, no mind is conceived, no ear is heard what God has prepared for those who love him. No one could have ever imagined the mystery of the gospel, but, but Paul says it has been revealed to us by his Spirit. This mystery of Christ, of how God would, would bring about his salvation in this moment, the angels have just seen it. They have just seen the unthinkable, God becoming a man. You know, sometimes for us in this season, I mentioned this earlier, you know, we know, many of us who grew up in church, we know the details of the story, and, and you know, we, we, we remember it. But the, the problem about that, that's a great thing, but the problem is that it becomes familiar to us, right? It becomes familiar, and we know the story, and what, it, what does it not do? It doesn't just blow us away with wonder. You know, if we could really see clearly... We would just all be going, I, what? I cannot believe he did this. But here's the thing about the angels. They see clearly. They watched him create the world. They, they've seen him face to face. They've seen his, his, his character. They've seen everything that he's done. They see the ways in which he was leading his people and, and uh, preparing all of these things for his people. They've seen him do all of these things. They've seen him create the world, and now they have just seen him lower himself, humiliate himself, enter into his creation, and become a human being. So what the, what the shepherds see here is the response of heaven. The angels see this and they say, glory to God in the highest. They sing it. They shout it. I cannot believe it. This is of all the things we've seen him do. This tops everything. Glory to God in the highest. Nothing glorifies God more than his radical grace portrayed in the coming of Jesus. Nothing. 
nothing of all of his qualities, his power, his wisdom, his, his might, his knowledge, of all of his qualities, nothing surpasses the glory of his grace. That he would choose to do this for his creation. You see, the angels see it clearly, and they say, glory to God in the highest. I cannot believe it. He has topped it all. And then they describe what it means for the earth. And on earth, here's what this means for the earth. Peace to men upon his, whom his favor rests. That's what it means, the implication for us. Peace. Peace first with God. He's made peace with us through the coming of Jesus as he's taken our place and lived the life that we have not lived. He's reconciled us to himself through Jesus. We have peace with God. And because of that, peace now comes into our relationships with each other. That's what Isaiah said as we read Isaiah chapter 9 at the very beginning. He says, every garment rolled in blood, every weapon used in war will be destined for the fire. When do you burn the guns and the tanks and the bombs? Only when you don't need them anymore. And that is the significance of him. Worldwide peace forevermore. So you see the angels, they're interpreting it for us. Ah, oh, glory to God in the highest. And what this means for you is peace. I got to share my favorite Christmas quote, and, and I've said this before. It's, I'm determined to, to, to both meditate on this quote every Christmas and to read it to you every Christmas because I, I just so captures my heart. It's a Frederick Beatner quote, and I think it's just, I think it's really what had set the angels on fire in this moment. But here's what he says. Once you've seen him in a stable, you can never be sure where he will appear or to what lengths he will go or to what ludicrous depths of self-humiliation he will descend in his wild pursuit of man. Now that's a lot of words. But do you see what Beatner is saying? When we look at the Incarnation, what we are seeing is God's wild pursuit of man. Oh, if we believed, oh, if you believed that he is pursuing you with that much reckless abandon. Oh, that we would see the ludicrous depths of self-humiliation. You know, Beekner looks at it and he sees the self-humiliation of Christ, the leaving the glories of heaven, the power, the comfort. I mean, he is the creator, and yet he left all of that to descend into the very depths of the brokenness of this world, even death on a cross. And Beekner says, it's ludicrous. It's ludicrous. That's what the angels say. Oh, it's ludicrous that you would do this for them. His wild pursuit of man. So here's, here's my encouragement for us tonight, tomorrow. As we look into the stable, as we look into the manger, I want it to show you his wild pursuit of you. His ludicrous self-humiliation for you. Because when you see that, I mean, when we experience the depths of his love and grace, it changes us just like it changes the shepherds here. They see that. They, you don't unsee that. They see it, and what do they do? Wow, that was cool. What a great light show. Glad we got to see this. Let's go back and hang out with the flocks. That's not what happened, right? They went and shared the good news. They went worshiping. I imagine they're dancing. What would happen in us if it began to hit home in our hearts more and more and more the significance of Jesus' incarnation? Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, the reality is as we look at the coming and the birth of Jesus, 
It's ludicrous. It becomes familiar to us, and we kind of imagine these are the kind of things that Jesus does. But we fail to see the self-humiliation, the cost. Lord, I pray that those realities would hit home in our hearts and that it would begin to break through, that it would break through the familiarity, that it would break through the coldness, that it would break through the distraction of all the other wonderful things, that we, tonight, tomorrow, this Christmas season, that we would be moved to worship because of your wild pursuit of us, that it would set us free to love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.